Megapost, what are your best past or future prank ideas for April's Fools? Story one. This takes place over a few days, but holy hell is it worth it. Step one, buy a wig and put it on something resembling a head. Ideally a mannequin head, but really any sort of round object will do. Step two, place head with wig on in your target's bed so that it's partially visible under the covers. Place pillows under the cover so it looks like a person. Step three, when they go to sleep, they'll get mildly frightened or surprised at the fake person in their bed. You're probably thinking, what a lame prank. Don't worry, the best is yet to come. Repeat step two a few nights in a row until they get used to it. Step four, after a few nights, wear the wig yourself and hide under their covers. They will grab the fake head to toss it aside as usual, at which point you let loose a blood-curdling scream. Step five, clean up their poop. Story two, my mom is a high school teacher. April 1st rolls around and she decides to prank her students. In order for the prank to be successful, she includes one student in her plan. So the day before, she tells this kid, we'll call him Brad, to take one of her old phones to class with him the next day. And she tells Brad to pull out the phone and text in class. Brad agrees, and the next day, when Brad starts texting using the mole phone, my mom promptly halts her lecture, walks up to Brad, takes the phone right out of his hands, and chucks the oh no thing out of her second story window. The look, as my mom describes it, on the faces of her students was priceless. No one laughing, no one smiling, just sheer raw horror. Always loved that one, never done a prank quite like it. Story three. When my wife and I were dating for about a year, April Fools came around. We have a good relationship with her parents. We all like each other very much. As a prank, I suggested to my wife that we tell her parents that she is pregnant. She told me it is a great idea. I come home from work a few hours later, and she calls her mom on speakerphone. Hey mom, guess what? I'm pregnant! Her mom's instant reaction was Nick, you piece of cow. What the fudge is wrong with you? How dare you do something like this? Then her dad chimes in. What's going on? Jess is pregnant. I'm going to flipping terminate him. Nick, you are flipping dead! Then their dog starts barking at me. I'm begging my wife to tell them it's a joke. She doesn't. She continues with, I thought you would be happy for us. Wrong. They continue screaming at me, making threats, calling me names, threatening to take me to court. I'm practically in tears because I was so close with them. Finally, her mom says, April fools! Jess called us an hour ago and told us what you guys were planning. Story four. Two I've been planning. One, get lots of boots from a thrift store. Place the pairs side by side, facing forward, in every bathroom stall in my office building. Lock the stalls from outside with a screwdriver. Two, acquire envelopes, place $1 bills in several. Label these $1 and attach them to places where people can reach them easily if spotted. Place $5 bills in a couple. Label $5. Place in inconvenient yet still accessible locations. Fill the remaining envelopes with notes reading, Happy April Fool's Day. Label these $10, $20, and $50. Attach these to visible yet ridiculously difficult places to reach. Denomination corresponding to the degree of difficulty. Story 5. I've been making booby traps around the house since middle school, but this is the first time using party poppers. This isn't the only one that will be set up, but I don't want my roommate to see this comment. My roommate has never experienced four over one with me before. Mohahaha edit more. I had these set all ready to get him nervous and twitchy before the actual day. Edit 2. Looks like my roommate hasn't noticed the post. Like the others, I will set it back up on four over one when the time is right. This one is triggered when the light switch is flipped. Edit 3. So far, all my traps have failed. The first one had a weak anchor and didn't work. The wonderful side effect is he too terrified to do anything. He gently opens every cabinet he needs to get into and generally acts like a soldier entering an enemy bunker. Story 6. After a front pager a while back, I want to get someone really drunk, then have them wake up to a note which says, Jack, you bumped your head tilde tilde last night. Tilde 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 a few days ago. Tilda tilde a little over a week, and the doctor says there's been damage to your hippocampi, nothing permanent, but right now your short-term memory is messed up. Yesterday you were able to keep it about an hour, then it just went. Doctor said rest is the only thing for it. Just rest and it should get better. Fingers crossed. P.S. Tick the letter once you've read it. P.S.S. Alex got his hair cut a week ago. Stop asking, it's bugging him. And then a load of ticks to imply he keeps forgetting. Story 7. My boss had one of those ink stamps made of his signature so that I could sign documents when he was out of the office. One April Fool's, I wrote this letter to another attorney. Dear so-and-so, you win. We give up. Your client can have the house, the car, the bank account, and even the dog. We would rather our client starve to death than to sacrifice another minute to your monumental ego. Then I signed it with the ink stamp and marked it faxed and put it on his chair with the rest of his mail. When he returned to the office, I said nothing. A few minutes after he arrived, I heard a sort of strangled choking sound from his office, followed by a, a Max wife, can you come in here, please? Good times. Story 8. I did this one a few years back to my brother. I put on Craigslist that I had two tickets to the upcoming Justin Bieber concert. You can use whoever, just check local listings. 
I said that I had gotten them for my girlfriend and I, but we broke up and I didn't feel like going alone. Being a good-natured fellow, I was offering said tickets to anyone who could call or text and tell me why they were the biggest Justin Bieber fan. I then listed my brother's phone number. For a full day, he had screaming little girls telling him all the Justin Bieber facts that they knew while I just sat back and laughed. Story 9. I read this thread to get inspiration. Then I picked my subject, my favorite high school science teacher, Mr. Science. Now, Mr. Science has a bit of an addiction of pirating things. He pirates lots and lots of movies, books, TV shows, and then offers them to anyone who wants them. We don't really care, but we always joke about his addiction. Also, my school starts at spring break tomorrow, so pranking on four over one is impossible. So last night I read this thread and then plotted the sting. I wrote a very official sounding letter from FBI headquarters. I wrote that he had 404 charges of copyright infringement, which were in direct violation of blah 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 DMCA. I then spent a solid two hours compiling a list of TV episodes, movies, and books, many of which he'd told us he had downed. This list ends up being nine solid pages plus the letter. Then to top things off, I find a high-res image of the FBI's logo and set it as the watermark in Word. After a miniature bracket to determine which font to use, I finally settled on Courier New. Perfect. Between the eighth and ninth page, I place a note explaining that it was all just a joke. Stop crying. Don't call your wife, etc. So this morning, I walk into the office, place the envelope in his mailbox, and tell the office ladies my plan. They giggle and then call him to the office to get his very official-looking envelope. He comes to the office, picks up the envelope, and freezes. He rereads the address a hundred times. He then opens the letter and his heart sinks. He meticulously reads the letter and list of infractions as he power strides back to his room. I stealthily follow him back to his room, watching him sweat and ruffle his hair in distress. Finally, he hits the eighth page and throws his hands up in defeat. I wait, crying, laughter, deaf laughter. SEAL Team 6 move in. He high-fives me and tells me that was the best prank ever in history forever. Story 10. April Fool's Day is my Christmas. A few years ago, it happened to fall on our spring break. My boyfriend at the time was taking a trip to San Diego with one of our friends. He knew how much I love April Fool's Day, so he wouldn't let it go. That wasn't it such a shame that he would be across the country, so I wouldn't be able to prank him on my favorite day. Challenge accepted. I didn't want to ask him what hotel they were staying at, as that would be suspicious. So I called every hotel in the area, asking to be connected to the room with his last name. On the 8th hotel, a match. They connected me to his room, and I disguised my voice, pretending to be Deborah from the front desk. I proceeded to tell them that we had to do some maintenance in that room, so we would upgrade them to a suite at no charge. All they had to do was pack up all of their things, come down to the front desk, ask for Deborah, and we would give them their new suite key. They packed everything up and were super embarrassed when there was no Deborah at the front desk. Pranked them from the other side of the country. Story 11. I worked as an IT help desk tech with two others in my office. April Fools rolled around and I decided the arrogant new guy deserved a little torture. Before he got to work, I connected a nano wireless mouse adapter to the back of his PC. I kept the mouse in my pocket and waited patiently. Every once in a while, I would give it a quick move and stop. After about five, six, he threw his hands up and started freaking out. I knew I struck gold at that moment. So I continued to do this through the day while watching Home Google Ways to Fix It. He then convinced himself that it must be a virus, to which I completely agreed. The mouse had a forward and back button, so whenever he got on a page that showed what could resolve his issue, I would hit back. He screamed, it knows I'm trying to fix it. I then explained how bad it would look for the new guy to get a virus from non-work-related browsing. Panic said it, and I probably should have stopped, but he really was an unpleasant person. So I had 10. 15 other employees come into our office from time to time to just ask questions and observe his torture. I finally took the mouse out and threw it on his desk, laughing hysterically at 4.55 p.m. I started this at 8 a.m. In case you felt bad, I got laid off two years later. He got to stay. Story 12. I've posted this a couple other times on Reddit in similar threads, but here it is again. There's a sales guy at my work who has his own printer in his cubicle, and one day I noticed it was also available as a networked printer. So every few weeks for about two years, I would send a Microsoft Word document to his printer, so it looked like his printer was talking to him. It would just be stuff like, Ray, I'm almost out of ink, so you might need to change it soon. Or, Ray, if you win the office NCAA basketball pool, can you buy me some semi-gloss paper to print on? That stuff is nice. I also signed all the print jobs. Sincerely, HL1440, which was the model number of his printer. He never knew who was sending all these documents to his printer and accused every single person in the office. He'd walk around with each printout and go up to everyone saying, I know this was you. Only a couple people knew who was really doing it, though, and they never told him. Fast forward a couple years, and for the month leading up to April Fool's Day, I just kept printing information on other printers from OfficeMax.com 
and OfficeDepot.com to his printer with no explanation. Then on April Fool's Day, I got to work early, stole his printer, and left a note from his printer to him telling him that it knew he was checking out other printers and that it was leaving him. I also hung up missing person style posters all over the office with a picture of his printer and a note saying to call him with any information about its whereabouts. Then I created an email address for his printer and throughout all of April Fool's Day, I sent emails to him from his printer telling him what a great time it was having without him and even included photoshopped pictures of his printer having fun in all these different situations. The last picture was his printer sitting on a dock near some water looking out and it just said something about how although it had a really fun day, it missed him and was coming home. Then I walked the printer back over to his cubicle. Here are all the pictures and the text from the emails that went with them. Hi, Ray. I just wanted to check in and see how you're doing as well as give you an update as to what I'm up to. Since I'm usually there hard at work bright and early every morning, I decided to start today off easy with breakfast in bed. It felt nice sleeping in for once. Also, I've attached a picture for you so you don't miss me too much. All right, though. Live with Regis and Kelly is going to be on soon, so I'll check back in with you later. P.S. Please don't be upset with me. I just need some time. Sincerely, HL1440. Hey Ray, here's a picture of me playing video games with some friends of mine. It's true what they say, video games really have gotten violent these days. Sincerely, HL1440. Hey there, Ray. As appetizing as lounging around at home all day watching TV and playing video game sounds, I decided to do some sightseeing as well. Here's a picture of some friends and I at Disney World. Sincerely, HL1440. Hey Ray, how's work going? Right now I'm emailing you from Hollywood, California, where I just visited the Hollywood Walk of Fame and found the star of one of my favorite singers of all time, Celine Dion. Attached is a picture for you. Sincerely, HL1440 Ray. I know I've been emailing you lots of pictures of me sightseeing, but please don't think I'm getting lazy. Here's a picture of me hard at work in the Oval Office, printing out important documents for the president's bank bailout plan. Sincerely, HL1440 Ray, I've had a lot of time to reflect today, and what I've realized is that I really miss working with you. I'm coming home. Sincerely, HL1440, Story 13. I'd made the classic mistake of leaving my computer unattended while logged into my Facebook. A friend made an embarrassing status update on my behalf. So to exact revenge, I created an exact replica of his Facebook page. Start with the slow and painful process of mirroring his page. Go into his profile and download all of his pictures. Copy and paste all of his information directly into the new false profile. The more attention that you pay to detail, the more believable it becomes. Once you find that you are happy with the authenticity of your page, you may begin requesting all of his friends. People seem to come and go on Facebook constantly removing and reinstating their profiles. So for me, it's not uncommon to have a friend request from someone that I'd assumed that I was already friends with requesting me again. I generally accept them with no questions asked. Once you've amassed enough friends, the revenge part of the plan may begin. You should closely follow the actions of your friend. If he updates his status, you update your status to conflict with his. If he comments on a post on someone's wall, you comment as well. You can either pull the repeater, or what I found to be more fun is to offer an opposing or conflicting viewpoint to everything that he says. I did this to a friend of mine. His name was O'Brien, so in the false profile I made him O'Brien. When people began to grow wise to the fact they had two of the same person appearing in their feed, I claim to be the real O'Brien, stating that I think I know how to spell my own name. I let it go on for about a week until he called me practically in tears, begging me to take it down. To this day, one of the best pranks I've ever pulled off. Story 14. I know this isn't really what you were looking for, but I think you'll enjoy anyway. In middle school, my mom told my brother and I that we should pretend to have gotten terrible grades on a test as an April Fool's joke on my dad. He, however, knew what we were going to do, so he was going to fake a heart attack because he was so mad. Well, mom turned this around yet again, and she made fake vomit out of cream of mushroom soup and Vienna sausages and told us to throw up on him because we were so upset about his heart attack. April Fool's comes along and dad gets home from work. My brother and I were sulking because we knew we were about to get in trouble for the bad grades we got, and dad lost it. He couldn't go through with it because he was laughing so hard, so I proceeded to pick up the vomit and throw up on him anyway. This led to the great vomit fight of 04, where my family picked up handfuls of vomit and threw it at each other for the rest of the night. That April Fool's ended up being one of my best memories. Story 15. My family has spent too much time pranking each other. My dad and his brothers went around collecting old Christmas trees off everyone's sidewalk and saved them up, and then put them on my aunt's lawn for April Fool's, with signs all around town directing traffic to the used Christmas tree lot. My uncle collected hundreds of keys of differing shapes and sizes and put them onto various key rings with my parents' contact information on them. He then had his family drop them at random places throughout the state for a week or two leading up to April Fool's. We were getting calls for months from people saying they found our keys. 
I read this one in the paper one time where this kid woke up super early and brick walled his front door with bricks and cement. Then he rang the doorbell and waited for his dad's anger. My brother woke up super early one time and moved all the valuable stuff in the house out into the garage. TV, DVD player, etc. Everyone thought we had been robbed. We covered my uncle's yard and everything in it with hot dogs one time. We put them in door handles, on top of the fence, all over the porch, etc. My dad is weird with hot dogs. These are the ones that come to mind. I will update if I remember more. Update one. I asked my sister and she remembered a few more. One time my brother replaced the toothpaste in the tube with foot cream and both my parents brushed their teeth with it. In retaliation for the hot dog incident, my uncle came late at night and put fish all over our lawn, live ones, toy ones, fishing equipment, giant dried up dead carp, everything. My brother and sister placed a dozen or so of alarm clocks in the room my older brother and his wife were sleeping in, and they set them to go off at random times throughout the night. They hid them really well, so even when they tried to find them all after the second or third one, they couldn't find them and they still had alarms going off all night. One time I had a coworker call my wife acting like someone from our neighborhood. She said that so-and-so, also in our neighborhood, had their baby. And we were grouping together to bring them a home-cooked dinner for when they got back from the hospital. And could my wife make brownies for them and bring it over around six? Then I came home and ate all the brownies right before she was supposed to take them over. The look on her face. Story 16. As much as I'd love to take credit for being the prankster in my family, that honor belongs entirely to my father. He has a reputation for enacting fiendishly clever capers. Like the time that he whittled a block of cheese into the shape of a bar of soap, complete with the dial logo, and left it in the shower for my stepmother to encounter. I know asterisk, I'll asterisk, never forget the time that he started covering the entrance to my room with newspaper. And then, after I'd gotten into the habit of bursting through it headfirst, nailed a sheet of plywood up behind it. Still, my father's best ever prank, at least by his own description, occurred during his college days when he lived in a dormitory reserved for engineering students. There was one tenant who didn't quite fit in with everyone else, as evidenced by the way that he would come home drunk every night, stagger through the halls and scream profanities at anyone unlucky enough to encounter him. He was also, it was discovered, the only non-engineering student in residence, and nobody was entirely sure how he had come to be housed in the building. One way or another, he was a nuisance. So on April Fool's Day, my father and his friends decided to teach that guy a lesson. With the cooperation of the entire floor, they strung a series of speakers together in sequence so that adjusting the LR balance on a stereo unit would make the sound move up and down the length of the building. Then they removed all of the lights in the hallway, leaving only the sinister red glow of the exit sign as illumination. Finally, they acquired a novelty record, which they cued to play a very special sound effect. When the drunkard returned home that evening, he was greeted by a long, dark hallway and an ominous, eerie silence. According to my father, the guy mumbled to himself in confusion for a moment before beginning to stumble in the direction of his room. Then, from in the distance, there came a barely audible sound. As it increased in volume, it became recognizable as a train, blowing its whistle as if in warning of some dire calamity. The inebriate faltered in his course, wondering aloud, and with obvious concern, what exactly was going on. The sound of the train grew further in volume to almost deafening levels. The drunk, now visibly panicking, began to shout for help. Finally, just as it sounded like the train was bearing down, my father's friend came running around the corner with a flashlight taped to his head. Legend has it that the drunkard awoke in the hallway the next morning, unaware of why he had soiled himself, but intensely suspicious of the toy locomotive that was clutched in his hand. Story 17. So my father was in a fraternity about 20 years ago on April Fool's. He was the president, and his job was to keep all of the pledges in check. One of his flipping stupid friends convinced the pledges to break into the medical building. Anyway, April Fool's passed, and my dad had no knowledge of what was going on. So at about 5 a.m. on April 2nd, the doorbell of the frat house rang. My father, being the head, ran down to answer it. It was the flipping asterisk, asterisk, FBI asterisk, asterisk, coming to investigate what happened the night before. Apparently, these pledges broke into the medical school, stole asterisk, not only asterisk, a complete cadaver, but five severed cadaver asterisk, asterisk heads in a bag from the medical department. And like geniuses, they were so freaked out by the bag of heads, and so they found a window to a garden apartment and asterisk threw the bag of heads in some random dude's flipping window. The investigation went on for months, but no one was convicted. My dad kicked out those pledges. This story is completely true. I'll try to find a news article about it from the 80s. Story 18. I pulled this prank on my friend who was rather computer illiterate. A couple years ago, I helped him illegally download Windows 7 because he really wanted it for some reason. Anyway, the whole time he was super worried that he was going to get a virus, which gave me the idea. I sent him an email under the alias lego underscore island underscore devotion, 
informing him that I had attached a virus to the download. To paraphrase what I said, this virus has given me the power to utterly destroy your computer at any time. However, there is no benefit in that for me. Therefore, I will deactivate my control if you record yourself beating LEGO Island and LEGO Island 2. These games deserve more appreciation, and I have taken it upon myself to spread them far and wide no matter the means. You have one week, he responded with protests of needing more time to find the games and a method to record himself. I refused. Then he was about to pay a guy to remove the virus when I told him it was me. Story 19. A few years ago, I filled my friend's truck bed with water, covered the bottom in aquarium gravel, put in fake reefs, sunken ships, etc., and filled it with 14 goldfish. I did this in the middle of the night. She had work the next morning. I have a few picks if anyone cares. Story 20. My chemistry teacher in high school told us about he and his buddy would make something. I can't remember the name. It had iodine in it, I think. When you made it, it was damp and non-reactive and easily molded. He and his buddy would take the damp stuff and stick it in keyholes in dorm rooms where it would dry. The dry stuff was extremely reactive, and so when other residents would stick their keys into the keyholes, the keys would set the stuff off. It would blow up in a huge cloud of purple breathe, which stains clothes, and makes a gunshot sound. Enough to make someone pour out the water their pants, especially because they don't know what just happened. Story 21. My son was born March 28th. He is a huge fan of the Harry Potter books, and he just finished the third one. We also happened to live in London for my job. On his 11th birthday, which is this year, we knew how much he would love a Harry Potter birthday party. So I rented an owl offline, tied a handwritten note to its ankle, and told him that I found it sitting on my car. When he opens the letter, he will find his acceptance letter to Hogwarts. We will then spend the next couple of days buying his wizard supplies and just generally preparing him for wizard school. Then on the first day of school, April 1st, of course, we will arrive at King's Cross Station, where he, with his trolley piled high with a menagerie of items, will wave goodbye to his proud father and teary-eyed mum. He will then take a running head start and plow straight into the brick wall between platforms 9 and 10. I'll then say, April Fools, and promptly begin paying for therapy. Story 22. I don't think this will be read at all, but I'm so proud of it I had to put it here. I worked as a trainer at a company that took telephone orders for a clothing catalog. There was three of us in the training department, as well as our direct supervisor, who would train new employees to do their jobs and existing employees to continue on to the customer service area instead of just taking orders. This was a pretty intensive job since it was a large company with many new hires weekly. For April Fool's Day a few years ago, I was struck by an idea to get to our supervisor. I presented the idea to the other two trainers, and we all agreed to do it together to put in fake two-week notices to quit our jobs, leaving our supervisor with the entire workload himself. In order for this not to backfire on us, however, we needed to let the manager and assistant manager know that if they saw these letters of resignation, that they were false. We didn't want asterisk them asterisk to think we were actually quitting our jobs. This worked out better than expected. They got involved fully. They asked me to turn in the resignations to them so they could take it to the training supervisor under the guise of being concerned about the sudden influx of quitting employees, supposedly because of him. That's what it looked like, too. I wrote that our supervisor was just too micromanaging, something he'd expressed a worry about before, not wanting to micromanage us and how we did things. The other two trainers complained about other aspects of the job that involved mistakes he was making, false mistakes, since he was a great supervisor. Fast forward about an hour, and the manager pulls us all into her office. She confronts our supervisor about the resignations, and he has this asterisk terrified asterisk smile plastered on his face. He was also a little flushed because he had zero idea what the hell he'd done wrong. The manager, in the way only an older Southern woman can, dragged out the slightly condescending speech for a few moments, then dropped the, we all just want to say, April fools. Our supervisor suddenly turned bright red and yelled pretty involuntarily, I think. Oh, nonsense. Then had to put his head between his knees. He was a full-time supervisor, a full-time college student, and convinced that he was going to have to train hundreds of people on his own. It was priceless, and to this day, it's my crowning achievement when it comes to pranks. Story 23. I work out of state with several different crews. Day starts off with a safety meeting. We then are in the field for most of the day, and then back to the office to deal with any paperwork, etc. We had a tech who was a real nightmare. Sexually harassed female employees. The hotel staff lied his way through the project. Stole some of the artifacts we were dealing with. A real piece of work. Most places you'd be fired, but for some reason, my company is incredibly forgiving about stuff. One of the techs has had enough and comes up with a great idea. Throughout the day, people would whisper things like, wake up, or it's a dream, or simply work the words into another sentence. I, so we've got three tests left and please wake up. This isn't real. Dig them quickly and get off this parcel, and so on. He started the day off laughing and calling us out, but no one cracked a smile. We just asked him if he was okay. 
I took him aside and inquired if he had come to work drunk or high. Later, I gave him the company line about counseling for people with work stress. We ate at the same diner most days. We had the waitresses in on it. He started looking a little worried. By the end of the day, my boss finally told us to cut it out. The kid had called his mom, who had called the company to complain. I don't know which part was better, making the guy twitch that much, or that he told his mom on us. Story 24. You know those poor chocolates you can only find at your grandma's house? The ones where they're covered in tinfoil, kind of big, but completely hollow on the inside? Well, my very large extended family were at my grandparents' house for dinner one day. My brother and I took one of those chocolates and decided to play a prank on my cousin. We found a Viagra pill in my grandpa's bedroom and crushed it into powder. We then poked a tiny hole into the bottom of the chocolate and dumped the Viagra powder into the hole. We melted another load over the hole to close it off and rewrapped that baby in its original foil. During dinner, my brother and I started talking about how amazing these chocolates we found were and that we ate every one of them, except one. My cousin, falling for it hard, shot up out of his seat and ran over to the chocolate bowl saying, It's mine, I call it. He couldn't have shoved it in his mouth faster. We were crying. It took a while to kick in, but after an hour or so, we noticed he would not get up off the couch no matter what was happening. Flipping hilarious edit. I'm glad you're all so concerned for my cousin's health. He did not pass away from a four-hour boner. I did tell him about it the next day, and he laughed about it, said he thought the chocolate tasted funny. All is well. Have a sense of humor. Story 25. Preface. My best pranking days are hopefully ahead of me. Anyway, a friend of mine has one of those massive DVD collections, so big that no one else in our circle ever has to buy movies, you know? Six years ago, we all lived on the same dorm floor, and he was gone on April. One. So we sat in his room and moved at least half of his movies to the wrong cases. Sometimes we would switch a disc between three or four separate cases. It took a while. To this day, the movie he grabs is often not the movie he gets. If he pulls Casino Royale, inside he'll find something like Space Jam instead. It's the prank that keeps on pranking. Six years later. Story 26. It would be oh no near impossible to pull off, but I contemplated pulling an identity switch prank on my girlfriend. Essentially, I'd have to convince her that she had really been dating one of my friends for years instead of me. To prepare, I'd have to go through all our photos together and either expertly Photoshop myself out and put my friend in. Probably would need a friend for that since I can't Photoshop for cow. I'd contact all her friends privately, filling them in on the prank so they could act accordingly. And then I'd get a friend, maybe someone with some acting experience, to prepare to play me. Meaning he'd have to know everything about her, the times we'd spent together, etc. I'd have to be prepared myself too, having a comprehensive fabricated account for the years I spent allegedly single. And then one night, my girlfriend and I would go to bed like normal. In the middle of the night, I'd slip out and change places with my friend. She'd wake up and scream, probably, and then we'd have to see how long we could keep the ruse up. There's probably more details and problems to pulling this prank off, but it's too daunting of a prank than I got time for, so I haven't really thought it through. Story 27. It didn't happen to me, but a buddy I went to school with. This is what he told us when he showed up with a cast. His mother, on the eve of April Fool's, silently screwed in a couple of pieces of wood over the door and the door frame, making it difficult to open unless you put some serious strength into it. She lit a couple of pieces of paper for the smell and used a breathe machine to imitate the house burning and pulled the fire alarm. She started yelling and screaming, fire, wake up. My friend said that he woke up and couldn't open the door and saw breathe coming under this door. Freaking out, he broke his window and jumped out, lived on second level to the ground and fractured his arm on the fall. His mom has yet to pull another prank like that. Story 28. I read this somewhere a while ago on Reddit, but here is basically the gist. If your roommate has a cat, empty out the cat's litter box once a day so there seems to be a mysterious lack of poop. When the roommate goes to clean the litter box at first, they'll think, hmm, must have not pooped today. But you do this the week leading up to April Fool's, or at least a few days. Then they'll get to the point of freaking out about why his or her cat isn't dropping deuces. This is when you strike. You eat something that you know will make your defecation very repulsive and asterisk you asterisk, yes, you, take a giant poop in the litter box and leave it there for your friend to find. Story 29. When I was a young warthog, I thought it would be funny to switch out the soap in our downstairs bathroom with maple syrup. I could just imagine the face of one of my family members squirting sticky syrup all over their hands when they expected soap. One thing I didn't really account for was that no one in my family really washes their hands when they use that bathroom. I quickly forgot about my prank. Fast forward three months. My grandparents had come over for some reason or another. I was walking through my living room to go outside. I passed the bathroom on my way out and noticed my sweet, quiet, 76-year-old grandma washing her hands after presumably using the loo. I thought nothing of it and continued on my way. And that's when I remembered. I had never taken the syrup out of the soap dispenser. I didn't know whether to feel tickled at what just happened or horrified. I loitered around the toilet room while my grandmother finished her business 
and as soon as she was out of sight, I ducked in and checked the soap. Yep, I could smell the sweet scent of Canada on my hands. I had just inadvertently tricked my grandma into using syrup as soap, and also any other poor soul who had used our bathroom in the last three months, but was too beta to bring up the fact that they had rubbed sugary molasses all over their hands after touching their junk. Story 30. A friend of mine was the best man at his buddy's wedding and took him out for a stag due the weekend beforehand. Needless to say, it got a bit out of hand, and the groom ended up passing out. A couple of their mates were doctors at a local hospital, so they got him in a cab and took him down to the ER room where they proceeded to put him in a full body cast that went from his armpits to just above his knees with the groin area cut out so we could still go to the toilet. When he woke up in hospital the next morning, they told him he had broken his back and was going to be like this for a while. All that week, his fiance was furious as they were getting married the following weekend. She had to help him go to the toilet wipe all week. They finally told him the morning of the wedding and helped him get out of the cast, and he showed up at the church back to normal. His wife still won't speak to them all. Story 31. I know it is not in April, but a good practical joke is timeless. Hunting camp is the worst place when you are the new guy in the group. One time on the night before the opening day of deer season, everyone stayed up late drinking beer and playing cards. At around 1 a.m., everyone went to bed and the lights were turned out. As soon as the new guy with us was asleep, everyone got dressed, set all the clocks and watches to 4 a.m., and woke the new guy. Telling him to hurry up because the sun was going to come up soon, they all went out into the woods. The new guy was told to stay put and wait for the crack of dawn. When someone saw a deer, they would drive it towards his direction. Then, everyone else quietly snuck back to the cabin and went back to bed. At the same camp, different year, they pulled the all-time best practical joke I ever saw. There was no plumbing in the cabin. Just an outhouse about 50 feet across the clearing out back. There was a bag of corn in the outhouse to keep it put of the rain. One morning, one of the guys woke up early and started for the ooh house before everyone else got awake. Approaching the shed, he saw the backside of a deer standing half in and half out through the door, with its head buried in the feed bag. With a sudden flash of inspiration, he snuck up and shoved the deer inside, slamming the door shut and hooking it. Then he went back to the house and sat on the chair on the porch with his coffee to wait for the next guy who needed to make a bathroom run. The look on the poor victim's face when he unbolted the door only to have it burst open and an 80 pounds deer jump out in his face was priceless. Story 32. Not one that I have coming up, rather it is one that I did before. Work in an office area with a bunch of cubicle type desk. For my department, we have two rows of desks consisting of around eight desks in each row. We all face our supervisor who sits at the front of the two rows facing us. And directly behind him is our VP for the whole floor. Both the supervisor and VP are super cool and have both pranked us before. Anyhow, a coworker and I wanted to screw with them last year for April Fools. Our IT department had been sending warning emails out consisting of warnings for spam emails that had viruses that our office had been receiving at the time. Basic warnings about not to open them, etc., etc. So I created a new email account to mimic one of the many people we dealt with throughout the day. Titled the subject line with something I knew they would see and open and sent it to both of them. In the email itself, I had thrown in a Word document attachment, also labeled with something they would open. But for the text of the document, I just threw in a bunch of random numbers and symbols. They both received the email, opened it up, and thought they had received one of those virus-containing emails. They flipped out. Now, this was not the whole of the prank. My coworker and I both had brought in wireless keyboards and mice and hooked the USB plugs to each of their computers prior to them coming in. So while sitting at our desk, we would randomly type something on the keyboard or move the mouse around. We did this throughout the whole of the day. Every time it was done, we were able to see their face twitch with confusion and fear that their computer had been infected. Finally, the VP couldn't take it anymore and called it to advise them that he and the supervisor both had infected computers. It came down, started looking at the computer, ran whatever diagnostic check they normally do, and found nothing wrong with the computer. They never checked for the USB plugs. In the end, I told them to call if it happened again so they could see it firsthand. But by this point, we no longer were messing with them and thought it was better off left alone. They both looked a little crazy that day. And the best part is that since they never figured it out, we still can do it to them again. Sorry for any typos. Typing this while at work and toggling between work screens. Story 33. Wasn't an April Fool's joke, but I wanted to share anyway. My dad was a trucker for a while in his 20s. One night he stopped at a rest stop outside of Houston, outbound and recognized one of his buddy's trucks. He knew this guy could sleep through anything, so he climbed in the cab, drove the truck to the nearest exit, U-turned and parked the truck at the rest stop on the opposite side. Years later, my dad ran into the guy, and he was telling the story about how one night he swore he parked at a rest stop outbound from Houston, and when he woke up and got on the road, he was headed inbound. My dad just had a cow-eating grin on his face. I believe the response from his buddy contained every curse known to man. Story 34. When a prank war I took part in escalated, 
I went to a few nearby charity shops and bought about a dozen factual books from each of them for about 5p each. You know the sort. A detailed guide to West Highland butterflies or craftsmanship in the Middle Ages. Books that you can't imagine anyone reading unless they're doing a really in-depth study or just very weird. So then I wrote in the front cover of each of them, important. This book is vital for my thesis. If found, please return to friend's name at friend's mobile number. 30 pounds reward. Then I left them in coffee shops, parks, lecture halls, etc. My friend got driven mad by people phoning him, telling him they had his book on Norwegian bell ringing societies. I never told him what I did. Also, a good one I did to another mechanically inept friend was when she asked me to check her car engine before a 200-mile drive, buy a fish, and place it above the engine block so it would cook and stink out her car the more she drove. Good times. Story 35. In the days, months leading up to April Fool's, repeatedly write spoon, spoon, spoons in white text so it isn't seen unless highlighted to a single coworker. Get some other coworkers to do the same. Your chosen victim's ads will start becoming exclusively for spoons. Start sneaking spoons into random places. Leave a spoon on their car seat. Put one inside their sandwich. You get the idea. On April 1st, GC and Jason fill up their cubicle with spoons. Use industrial-sized packing tape to secure the entrance. Hide in the middle of the pile and surprise them when they come in for work. Then scoop their eyes out with the spoons and eat them. Remember, it's always forgiven if you say April Fools. Uh, story 36. Two years planning. I make a Facebook account for a person, female, that doesn't exist, complete with pics, and friend a bunch of random people on March 31st of 2011. I use said profile to publicly message my main profile, I'm male, every now and then, and friend some mutual friends. Mind you, my entire family is on FB and active. So this morning, I jump onto the fake profile and upload two pictures and tag my real profile. The pics are, one, a picture of an ultrasound, shooped to have the name of my fake person, and with the date fixed to be two days ago. I also hit a xenomorph skull in the image. Two, a picture of some woman's hand laying flat with an engagement ring.